Take your Bibles to, and turn into Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, we also have the verse sheet on your bulletin that goes along with the message. And you can see the title on there, Forward March. Forward March. We've been looking, this is the third in our series, Fresh Start. Starting 2017 off in the right way and making sure that we're headed the right direction, uh, doing the right things. Well, last week we looked at building and battling, you know, getting ready for the, the battle that is before us, being prepared for it, having the right defenses. And today's kind of a continuation of that, just using a different uh, passage of Scripture. We have looked at a bunch of verses in the book of Ephesians, and we have, in the last two messages, referred to Ephesians chapter 6, and I looked at a few verses, but now we're going to get into it uh, here today. You know, the elite team of Navy SEALs, uh, you know, an elite team back in 2011, on May 1st, they, were, they killed Osama bin Laden. And shortly after that, you know, shortly after that, a lot more things were written about the Navy SEALs and things. And uh, a former Navy SEAL wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal and uh, trying to say, well, you know, what makes a successful SEAL? And that's kind of a hard thing to say. You know, they're known as really the best warriors in the world, um, some of the best uh, there. So how do they become a Navy SEAL? What quality makes them successful? And uh, he said the ability to think about other people in a higher purpose is the, the one thing he thinks above all others. You know, entering into become a, a Navy SEAL, they go through rigorous training, uh, the, the BUDS training is a grueling six months. And so you have all these people that are wanting to get in, the best of the best, and he said a lot of them are even, uh, they had been high school football stars and even college football stars and, and uh, track and field stars in their school or even uh, national champion swimmers. Uh, and all these different athletes wanting to get in there and show what they could do, thinking they could do it, or wrestlers and boxers. On that, but in the end, about 90 percent or between 80 and 90 percent fail. Only between 20 and 10 and 20 percent uh, ever make it on that. They end with what they call Hell Week for the last week. And this is well, what, how can they, you know, at the beginning of the time, will they be able to see, oh yeah, he's going to make it, he's going to make it, but he's not. And they said, no, a lot of times the strongest ones, the ones that think that they're going to make it because they have big biceps that doesn't mean that they're tough, you know, and they don't make it. Uh, or the ones uh, who are the look at me, former athletes who have always been told that they're stars, they find out not so much uh, in those situations. Uh, or you have others who are the kind of preening leaders who don't want to get dirty, uh, and they don't make it either. But often the ones that, that were, you know, on the first runs, when they're going on those long runs with packs in their back, you know, they're throwing up and they can hardly make it and they're, uh, they have trouble doing pull-ups and maybe they're skinny or they're short and they're, you know, just looking at the water, their teeth are chattering. And he went and described all these, you know, all these things there that seems like there's no way they could make it. They're visibly afraid when they go in, into that, but they often make it. And he said this, it's those... He can't really find out who does make it, but he can point to who doesn't make it sometimes. Uh, but one thing that they do have in common, the ones that do make it, he said they step outside of their own pain, put aside their own fear, and ask, how can I help the guy next to me? He, said, he also said uh, they also had a heart large enough to, to think about others. You think about that. Somebody who is too small to do a and too weak to do a pull-up to start the thing, he survives because he's thinking, how can I help somebody else? Well, if he can't even help himself, how can he help someone else? Well, there's a secret in there. I think there's, a, there's an exciting thing in there. So often when we just focus on ourselves, we're going to find out that we can't do as much as if we were to focus on others. And I think in the Christian life, that's even more so. That's even more because we have a secret ingredient that the world does not have. 
Uh, we'll get to that here in a little bit. But look at 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, dishonest to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. They only think of themselves. We're going to see that more and more in the last days. And I believe, you know, we are in the last days, I believe. And hey, they're going to be lovers of your own self. You know, look out for number one. Uh, Or you hear a lot of believe in yourself, which is just the most foolish thing. You hear it all the time, and so I'm going to say it all the time that it's a foolish thing. Uh, believe in yourself. If you just believe in yourself, you'll accomplish. And you hear, you see a lot of Olympic athletes say that. So the only reason they made it is because they believed in themselves. Well, what about the millions of other people who didn't make it? It's because they didn't believe in themselves. So if they were to believe in themselves more, what they would have beat you? So then yours doesn't work? Like, you know, I mean, it's just foolishness. Uh, but. We're going to see more and more uh, that kind of uh, foolish, foolish behavior. And so as you see more of this, we, need, we have the answer. How do we combat all of these things that are going, these perilous times that are coming? How do we combat that? How are we going to prepare, be prepared to not only survive ourselves, but to march forward, to help other people? If we don't have that mindset to help others in this, then we're not going to survive ourselves. I don't think. Uh, point one, know your enemy. John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might live and that they might live, uh, they, might, they might have it more abundantly. Uh, they might, I have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So Christ come is saying hey i came so you can have life so you can live a more abundant life whereas satan does the opposite of that he has never had a good intention ever uh since the fall uh, since he fell of course he has never had a good intention ever he's going to try to gain ground uh in the battle anyways uh, and he's going to try any way he, that he can in your life. He's going to try to gain ground in, in there. But Jesus has, he only has good intentions. He only has good intentions. He wants you to have a more abundant life. You know, during the Revolutionary War, which just this last week, I heard a message actually, and a guy said we shouldn't call it the Revolutionary War. We should call it the War for Independence, which is what it was. Because he said, you know, it's, it wasn't like the, the revolution in France. Uh, where it's just anarchy, uh, because we had a government the entire time during the War for Independence. Uh, we had, there was a Continental Congress in Philadelphia. George Washington wasn't just out doing whatever he wanted. He answered to Congress uh, and that and asked for advice and asked for things and, and, they, and don't, did what they permitted him to do. So we had laws the entire time. So it, was, you know, it wasn't necessarily a revolutionary war, it was a war for independence. But anyways, during the uh, war for independence, there was a loyalist spy. Uh, so someone, yes, who lived here, but still back to the, the crown uh, in England. And they went to, so this spy went to the headquarters of the Haitian, uh, the Hessian commander, um, Colonel Rawl, and he carried an urgent message. But they wouldn't let him into Colonel Rawl there. And the message was that George Washington and his Continental Army had secretly crossed the Delaware River and they were coming. Uh, they were advancing on Trenton, New Jersey. And uh, the, that's where the Hessians were encamped. And, but the guy that wouldn't let him come in said, oh, you could write it on a piece of paper. So he wrote it on a piece of paper, sent it in. Well, the... Colonel Rawl was too busy playing a poker game. So he took that paper and he stuck it in his pocket. Well, 
when the first shots were fired as George Washington and them approached the fort there, he was still playing poker at that time. And uh, the day after Christmas in 1776, we were able to capture that fort and really the first major victory uh, that we had in the war. Um, and they needed it desperately. They needed it desperately. The things that had happened in uh, earlier in the year, like in September, losing New York City and nearly losing the, in the entire army, um, except for the, the providence of God, uh, letting them escape, they would have. But here, they were received a warning, but they were too busy doing something else to pay attention to the warning. Well, in the Word of God, we see warnings here. Hey, the enemy wants to destroy you. The enemy wants to make it so you are worthless, so you do nothing in your life. And how often are we too busy doing something else and we just stick the warning away? We just put it in our pocket. We just put it somewhere. I'll worry about that later. And as the enemy's there attacking, destroying us, it's already too late. It's too late. Listen to the warnings. Uh, Jesus gave Peter a warning in Luke twenty two thirty one, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that, ye may, that he may sift you as wheat. Satan, want, if he wants to sift Peter, don't you think he wants to do the same to us? That he wants to have us. He wants to destroy us. He wants to use us for his evil, you know, evil intentions, the bad intentions that he always has. Now, right after this, Peter was warned by Jesus that he was going to deny him three times. And Peter didn't, wouldn't listen. I will not. I wouldn't do that. I'll die for you. And what did he do? He denied him three times. Just a little while later. And it's because the reason he said that, he let pride get in the way. Um, just a little while before that, when Jesus was saying, one of you is going to deny me, is going to betray me, each one of them said, is it I? Is it I? So even Peter would have said, is it I? And then here he's saying, oh, you know, I won't deny you. Uh, I think in the, you know what happened in the meantime? They were arguing amongst themselves of who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. They let pride get in there. They let pride get in there. Uh, so often, you know, maybe people don't listen to warnings because, well, I know a better way. Well, the intelligence that God gives us about the enemy is perfect every time. You know, the, the CIA gets it wrong sometimes. You know, we might go to war based on false things, or we might think an election was influenced because of false things, or whatever the case may be. The CIA gets it wrong sometimes, right? But God's intelligence about the enemy is always right every single time. We better be prepared for it. And he tells us in 1 Peter, so now this is Peter, you know, speaking. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He wants to destroy us, wants to, to end us, and so be ready. He's always looking for attack. When, he's, when is he going to attack? When you're least expecting it when you're not ready, when you take down your defenses. Uh, there was an American photographer named Jimmy. Uh, he went to Africa with his family, and they, were, they went into many dangerous areas. And they, they were in a Jeep, and they drove right in the midst of these lions that had just killed a, a buffalo. And they were told they could do that as long as you stay in the Jeep. Stay in the Jeep. And they were told how to be safe, and don't wander out on your own. You know, stay with the Jeep. Well, just before this family had been there, there was a, uh, a, a family from Japan who had just been there before them, and they didn't listen to the instructions. And the father had gotten out thinking, oh, I can get a better angle from a little different. Well, the lions immediately attacked and killed them there because he wouldn't listen to the advice. He thought he could, oh, he thought in his own strength he'd be fast enough to get back in. How often we think, well, in our own strength, in our own way, you know, I, I'm good enough. I, I know how far to go. I know, you know, God doesn't know me. You know, I could, 
have a little better way. I can go a little farther than other people because I'm better, I'm stronger, I'm faster, whatever. Well, it didn't work for that guy and it's not going to work for us in the Christian life. Well, the lions there, they also, um, lions also like darkness. Uh, sometimes that works better to attack it at night. And back at the camp, uh, at the camp there, they could walk around in the daylight around camp, but as soon as it was dark, you could not go outdoors unless you had an armed guard with you. Uh, that was just a rule that they, that they had. So they were warned of what and how to be prepared. Well, we see a warning here in Ephesians 6, verses 11 and 12. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He's circling that camp, looking how to get in. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So at that camp, where they had to have somebody else had to be with them in order to go outside and in, in order to venture out because they didn't have what they needed to defeat the enemy, you know, to kill the lion there. Well, same thing with us. We don't have the right weapons to fight the devil in our own strength because it's not, it's not flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers. We need the, arm, the armament of God in order to, to fight this. One night, uh, the photographer Jimmy and his family, they were waiting to go to dinner. It was dark out, so they're waiting for the armed gunmen uh, to come and waiting and waiting. And after about 45 minutes, you know, I mean, at this point, they're really getting worried and they're opening the door a little bit, sticking out, thinking maybe they forgot about us. They forgot someone was in this cabin here and we're not going to be able to go eat dinner. You know, or can we make a, a dash for the dining hall? And they just waited and waited. And finally, a guy came and he said, well, the reason I took so long is because I was waiting for the, for the lion to leave that was waiting to pounce on anybody who stepped out. So he had seen the lion coming. So it's a good thing they didn't uh, step out uh, there. He didn't want to just shoot it when it wasn't pouncing on somebody. But had they gone out? they might have really had it sometimes you might feel like god has forgotten you you think man did they forget about us you know but god hasn't forgotten you you might think other you know, other people can forget about us but god has never and will not forget about us sometimes you might think that well since it seems like he's forgotten it, maybe i can go out on my own maybe i can do that one thing well the devil is waiting for that one time. He's waiting to pounce. Those are the times we're most vulnerable. So we need to know our enemy. Point two, put up the strongest defenses. And we could spend a lot of time going through each of these things, but we'll just speak briefly um, on this, the different armament here. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 to 18. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked." And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You know, the only part that you might have you probably heard this before, but the biggest part that's not protected is the back. You know, we will not win the battle running the wrong direction. We have to be, face the enemy Stand strong. You know, during uh, the 1982 war in the Falkland Islands between England and Argentina, there was a Royal Navy destroyer, a 3,500-ton destroyer that was sunk with a single missile fired from a fighter jet, an Argentine fighter jet. And it caused some people to wonder if, you know, modern surface ships were going to be kind of obsolete if it was no longer going to be able to be used 
uh, because of the, the missiles were so sophisticated now and they wouldn't be able to, to dodge or have any defense against them. Well, when they figured out some of the things that went, that went wrong, what it was, the, the computer recognized the incoming missile and it properly identified it. Well, what it was was a French-made missile. Well, the French are our allies. So it said, you know, it was friendly fire, so it wasn't coming at us. It was just must be going overhead. You know, so identified it, assumed it wasn't coming at them, and they did no evasive maneuvers or anything to try to stop it or destroy it, and it was a direct kill. Well, God tells us what will destroy us and how to stop it. So we can identify the enemy that's coming. We can identify the things that go against God's word and make sure it doesn't penetrate our own lives. Making sure it doesn't destroy us. So we have here a list of, of the armor. We have the you know, loins girt about with truth. You know, truth is truth. Truth does not bend. You know, some people, they have their own facts, their own version of the facts and that are just wrong. And or people try to interpret facts different ways. And you see this in the political realm and even sometimes a lot of times even in scientific uh, things, they interpret things differently. But truth is, is truth and the truth of God's word does not bend. It does not bend. Righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness Righteousness does not change. What was righteous when the Bible was written is righteous today. Righteousness does not change. Oh, but we're in a different day and age. You know, some marriage can change and this can... No, righteousness does not change. Have your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, the gospel does not stop. You know, the gospel isn't, uh, you know beat people over the head with it. We're not to win by conquest. It is gospel of peace, but the gospel doesn't stop. We shouldn't stop proclaiming it. Oh, that's, you know, hate speech saying that Jesus is the only way. No. Remember, truth does not bend and righteousness doesn't change. So if truth doesn't bend, if that was the truth then, it's still the truth today. Don't let it bend. And do not stop. The gospel does not stop. Keep moving forward with the gospel. And then we have the, the shield of faith. We have to learn how to use that shield. It takes practice. It takes work to know how to, yield the, how to use the shield of faith so we can quench the fiery darts of the wicked. So as believers, we need to have strong faith because that strong faith is the perfect defense. And then we have the helmet of salvation. Our salvation is secure forever. We are protected. We can't be sent to hell. And being secure forever with that, the salvation that God has given us as Christians, as believers, we can, when we have that security, when we have that knowledge that we can't lose our salvation, it gives us so much more courage to go out and, and fight the battle. We don't have to worry about losing our salvation. And... Then we have the, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Bible is the best weapon for every battle. It's, there's not some battles where it's, well, that's not really relevant for today. No, it is always relevant. The Bible is the best weapon for every battle. And then it talks about prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You know, we started out talking about looking out for others. Well, that's how this ends. Talks about, yes, armor. We have to be prepared ourselves. We have to be ready for the battle. Just like, you know, on an airplane, they always tell you, put on your own oxygen mask. You know, if it depressurizes and you have to put, use the oxygen, you put your, yours on before helping the children, right? Uh, or as one stewardess said, the flight that we were on before helping children or politicians or people acting like politicians. Uh, <laughs> they might need more help than the children sometimes, right? But you, help, you put your zone on so you don't pass out while you're doing that because then you can't help anybody. So you need to have the armor on, but then what? Look out for others, for the other saints. 
It's a priority. It must be a priority. And even beyond looking out for the saints, it even goes beyond that. We'll see that here in just a, uh, a second. But God's way only works all the time. Right? All the time. It only works 100% of the time. You can't just... But we have to obey completely. We can't just do... Well, 90% obey and think it's going to work. No, we need to obey him completely. Uh, point three, receive the, the victory in the offense. So, yes, we have to have the best defense, but now what about the offense? Ephesians 6, 19 and 20. So these are the verses right after it, following right after it. So he just told them to pray, look out for the saints, and for me. So this is the Apostle Paul, the boldest bravest preacher probably of all time and he says and for me that utterance may be given unto me that i may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel for which i am an ambassador in bonds that therein i may speak boldly as i ought to speak so you need to have all this armor that's described here and then pray not only for yourself, but for all saints and for him that he would be bold in proclaiming the gospel. There are, you know, there's a lot of bold people out there who do bold things, but they're just fools. Being bold is enough, but it, being bold in the right things. The Apostle Paul wanted to be bold so that he could make known the mystery of the gospel. So that he can make known the most important thing in the world. So that he can be an ambassador, whether he was in bonds or not. That he would speak boldly. And it's, it's, and it's not a thing, it shouldn't be out of the ordinary to speak boldly. Because what does he end that with? As I ought to speak. Not that he'd be some superhuman Christian, some super Christian, out of the ordinary. No, as I ought to do it. That's what we ought to do. That's what expect, is expected. If we have that, that armor on us, the proper conclusion of that is to look out for us. Oh yes, it said pray for the saints. Well, who's the gospel for? It's for this lost and dying world. It's for those who don't know the truth. Those who are lost on their way to hell. You can be a bold fool that has nothing worth fighting for, or you can be a bold ambassador of Jesus Christ that claims the victory. So which kind of bold person are you going to be? There's no coincidence, though, in chapter 6 here, that this passage we're looking at comes right on the heels of, it's a striking contrast, right on the heels of, of, of the family even. The Apostle Paul had just finished talking about, you know, husbands do this, wives do this, kids do this. Even servants do this, rulers do this, you know, how to have order in the family and at work and how to have order even in society there. And he follows that up by saying as Christians, this is the armor uh, that we need. In order to do right in other areas of our life, we have to be ready to fight. We have to be ready to fight uh, the enemy, be moving forward, to have that forward March. In Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus spake, uh, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And you know, we'd be pretty hopeless if we were putting this armor on. So he says, Okay, this is a battle you can't fight in your own. You know, I'll help you. But he had no power. But all power was given unto him in heaven and in earth so that he can fight the principalities and powers that, uh, that exist there. So we need this battle in order to have, in order to raise our kids right, in order to be the proper husband and wife or the proper master or proper worker. Work. We have to, as Christians, have this armor in moving forward. Christ has all the power, not Satan. Oh, sometimes it seems like that. As you see, even just the wickedness the last few days. You know, there's a lot of bold people around, right? You know, that they're boldly 
you know, burning cars and breaking windows. And I saw um, Larry King tweeted a thing that his, his driver, his hired car, the de- their car, the windows were broken and, and that. He was inside safe at the time when it went out and his driver was pretty shaken up uh, there in, uh, he's in Washington, D.C. What foolishness. Are people that are shutting down highways and stuff? I mean, what, what in the world are they accomplishing? Are they bold? Yes, they're bold, but they're boldly being a fool is what they're doing. They're not accomplishing anything except proving how foolish they are. Uh, they're very good at accomplishing that. But there's so many people that think that they're all powerful. And sometimes it seems like, man, Satan's just taken over. But no, God is all powerful. The gospel still works. We have the answer to all of that foolishness. We have the answer to that. Or you have celebrities getting up and protesting stuff and you know, cussing in live TV and saying that they've, they've thought a lot about blowing up the White House. Uh, I mean, unbelievable. And uh, Madonna said that. I'm thinking a lot about blowing up the White House. Um, hopefully the Secret Service is giving her a hard time uh, <laughs> saying something so foolish. Um, but we do have, the, the gospel is the answer to that foolishness. It would work just as good for someone as wicked as that. Because it worked just because it worked for someone as wicked as us, so it can work on them as well. Sin is sin, right? Uh, don't give ground to the devil. Don't retreat. Many churches today are giving ground to the devil. They're doing it whether it's in compromising music, or immodest dress, or you know just morals or the gospel. Start changing the gospel. Well, I don't want to say Jesus is the only way because that offends somebody. Start compromising the gospel. So they start to try to bend the truth. Well, it's no longer truth anymore. Don't compromise. Uh, not giving ground is not thriving. It is only surviving. So, well, you might have to think about that for a second. Not giving ground is not thriving. It's only surviving. You might be thinking, well, I'm standing. You know, I'm not giving ground. Okay, so that's surviving, but that's not thriving. We want to forward march. We want to do more than just not give ground. We want to be moving forward. We want to use the sword of the Spirit. We want to use that shield of faith to quench the fiery darts so that we can move forward. If we give ground, I think the first will be our kids or be the first to go. Uh, and if we don't fight off the enemy, you know, our kids are going to suffer and the weaker Christians will suffer as, re- as a result. So God not only gives us instruction here, he also gives us the green light to go for the victory. Use the armament that you have to do what you ought to do. Go out and boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. He gives us a guarantee that no one else can, that he will be with us. There's no downside to be on the attack for Christ. He has the winning battle plan. He has the secret to success in this. So that's the greatest thing uh, we can do. Arm ourselves and fight the battle that we ought to fight. So are you ready to fight? Are you prepared for the battle? You know, think about this. Do you know someone who needs Christ? So, well, of course, you know, <laughs> we all know someone, or if we walk, just walk down the street, we'll at least see someone that needs Christ, right? Even if we don't know them, we'll march forward. Do you know someone that's hurting? Well, then march forward. Do you know someone that's searching for something in their life? Then march forward. Do you know someone that's in trouble? Then march forward. The gospel is the answer it is the answer so what is what is the gospel well simply that is that jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and if we believe in that we can know for sure we're going to heaven letting this hand uh, represent all of us the wicked sinners uh, represented by the wallet is our sin we all have sin on us we've all fallen short of the glory of god we cannot go to heaven with that sin. It separates us from God. If we die with that sin on us, we'll die and spend an eternity in hell forever. 
but let this hand reverently represent Jesus who came to this earth, lived a perfect life. He never sinned. The only one that could be said of. He never sinned. And because of that, he was able to die in our place. Since the penalty of sin was death, he said, hey, I'll do that for you. He died on the cross. He shed his blood, was buried, and the third day rose again, showing that God accepted that payment. So he says, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So when he died on that cross, he paid our sin debt. If we just believe we can have eternal life. Not by our works, but putting our trust and faith in him and him alone. We can know for sure that we're going to heaven. I hope that you've accepted Christ as your Savior. And if you have not, uh, do so now. Don't wait another, another moment. And uh, those hopefully watching on YouTube, uh, you can also right now believe that Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood, was buried, and the third day rose again. And you can know for sure that you're going to have.